Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in attendance here. Um, this is a wonderful uh, venue for us to be able to do this in. We really appreciate our partnership with the um, U of A and their telemedicine program. For those of you attending via a webinar online, uh, please be aware that at the top of your screen, up where I'm pointing here, that's how you ask questions. We won't be answering any questions until the very end of the presentation. So for those in attendance, we ask that you please wait until the end with your questions. Um, and for those of you attending via webinar, please go ahead and, and submit them anytime, but be aware that we're not going to address them until the end. Um, today's being pre presentation is being um, uh, facilitated with myself. I'm the Office Chief of the Office of Special Licensing in the Division of Licensing Services for the Arizona Department of Health Services. Also here with me today is Don Gibson, who is our licensing team lead in the Office of Special Licensing, and also Laura Bryan, who is our administrative assistant in the Office of Special Licensing. Um, just a little bit of background information, and um, I'm going to move through the first couple of slides very quickly. Um, but before I start, I just want to let everyone know in attendance and viewing uh, via the webinar uh, that the webinar is, is being recorded and we will make it available online um, sometimes towards uh, the end of next week it will be available moving forward. Um, we will also make available online all of the attachments that we reference. Um, so for those who are in attendance, they received a, little, uh, just a couple of more attachments than the ones that were sent an email in the um, original invitation. Um, everybody should have a copy of the new rules um, as well as a copy of our inspection tool um, that went out with the invitation. Please feel free to share those amongst your colleagues and certainly amongst your coworkers. The presentation that we're going to have today was also um, developed in collaboration with the Arizona Department of Health Services Health Emergency Operations Center that's facilitated by the Bureau of Emergency Ma um, Management. I'm sorry, emergency preparedness, and also with um, some consideration from advocacy groups, especially the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing. So we want to thank them. Uh, the goals and objectives for today's trainer, we're hoping to identify um, the various roles of the department for you. We want to describe and clarify the licensing process, um, to clarify the fire inspection process and what changes are going to be brought about as the new rules roll out. Um, we also want to clarify the complaint investigation process and to describe um, the kinds of technical assistance that will be made available to our licensees um, and other stakeholders moving forward. Um, the objectives are there. I think it's you know kind of evident that the things that we hope you'll get out of this certainly will be available uh, via phone and via our technical assistance website, uh, I'm sorry, mailbox and um, you can also post things to our website for response, um, and you can also uh, request in uh, a site on-site technical assistance meeting. You can also come down to the Arizona Department of Health Services and request an appointment. We do accept walk-in people as well. So in any way, shape, manner, or form that you care to submit um, a request for technical assistance, we're here to help. Our authority is found in Arizona law, and I'm not going to read these to you, but those are the references if you ever care to look them up. It's pretty dry stuff. Um, the Arizona Department of Health Services um, is in the current process of developing a new strategic plan, and with that came a new mission statement, which is to promote, protect, and improve the health and wellness of individuals and communities in Arizona. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, our new vision statement is health and wellness for all Arizonans. Our mandates are to ensure the safety of the housing structure and the environment with specificity to group homes for the developmentally disabled. We want to reduce the potential for hazardous conditions to exist and ensure adequate emergency and disaster preparedness in the home. And we want to provide timely service to providers, residents, and other stakeholders, provide resources and support and to increase and ensure compliance, and provide technical assistance to providers in support of our shared missions. I mentioned earlier we have different roles in the department and specifically within our office. Um, so these are a few of them. We're obviously law enforcers with respect to the licensing rules. We're inspectors, of course. We also are our investigators. We also are report writers. 
Sadly, as a state agency, a bureaucratic system, we also are paper pushers, and we are um, customer service assistants overall. We have some shared um, roles with you. Um, like you, we care about and advocate for people with special needs. Also, like you, our goal is to see that you succeed. And by you, we mean our licensees and our stakeholders. How do we do all of that? We do that through licensing and fire inspections, complaint investigations, compliant actions, which used to be called enforcement actions, customer service, technical assistance, and the provision of training and support. And then I mentioned earlier that ADHS has a strategic map. I think it's a really good idea for us to share that with our stakeholders and licensees and um, point out where we fit into all of that. So this is the um, strategic map. It's pretty involved. Um, it's very comprehensive. Um, in my uh, professional opinion, I think it's very um, impressive as well. The Office of Special Licensing, um, if you can see here in the column to the left, um, delineates uh, all of the various pieces of the map that have implications for the work that we do with respect to DD group codes. Um, I'm not going to go into any of these in any great detail, um, but I think it's important to point out that um, slot number C5 to promote health and safety community environments, that um, carries the bulk of what we do. Um, and with respect to implementation of best practices, we um, hope to do that with our sister agency, DES, with the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and aligning resources with key priorities, we hope that that's how we dovetail with access as the funding source. Now I'm going to turn this over to Laura Bryan, who's going to talk about our application process. Laura? Hi. Okay. There are six steps to um, um, licensing a group home. Five of them are with DES and DDD, and the fifth one being us, ADHS. The first step is to attend a one-day group home seminar to learn about the required, or what it is to require to operate a group home. The second step is to apply to become a qualified vendor with DDD. The third step is to apply uh, for a home and community-based service with OLS, or OLCR, which is DES office. The fourth step, if you are approved to become a qualified vendor and completed the first um, one, two, three steps, um, Oh, um, a district resource staff will contact you with further information. Obtaining um, agreement with the division does not guarantee consumer referral. The district resource staff will explain the replacement process when they contact you. ADHS is the fifth step, which is us. That includes comprehensive on-site licensing inspection, fire inspection, and vehicle inspection. The licensing period is for two years. A fire inspection is conducted every 24 months upon re renewal thereafter. The sixth step, all the group homes must have insurance required by the contract terms and condition prior to their provision of services. Basically, DDD is going to do a walkthrough. Okay, let's turn back to the fifth step, which is us with ADHS. Um, we have new application and new processes. When I receive, um, or the department receives an application, um, I basically have to look through it entirely to make sure it's complete. If there's information missing, um, I'll be sending you a letter requesting this miss missing information, which may delay your um, licensing inspection. Um, along with the initial application, uh, we're also requiring, because of the 1070 law that passed, requiring citizenship and legal alien status. This is with the owners and or the um, officers that represents the, uh, represents the business entity. Also with that, we are asking for, uh, it's required to, for a copy of your QVA. Okay. We also have a, renewal, a new renewal application and um, also I make sure that it's complete. I also, um, look up Arizona Corporation Commission to check with the agency and also the officers that are on the application to make sure it matches up. 
We also require a copy of the QVA. Um, and as you renew your um, QVA with DDD, um, it'll they'll contain an uh, address on there, and I'll be you know matching up the address with the license that you're renewing. Um, if you have a change of address, we treat it as uh, initial. The license is only specific to the um, address that we issue the license to. So if you change the address, you want to apply as an initial. And with our license, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's address specific. Um, one of the changes that we'll have is on the name. It'll have the agency owner and the group home all in one line, and that's so that we have better tracking with our database and um, our department. We'll have the fire risk prevention level on the license. Also, the original license must be at the home, um, posted somewhere um, conspicuously. Excuse me. <laughs> um, also, there's a reference on the license at the bottom that um, refers to a statute that your license remains in effect until we act upon a, the application. And moving right along, um, Don Gibson will be um, introducing you to the inspection process. <coughs> okay, before I get started, I just want to remind the, the webinar users to send questions to Rono Geppert and not the ADH, ADHS name. Uh, so that way we get the questions for the people who are doing the webinar. Okay, gonna be going over the inspection process. Uh, we're gonna call you to schedule the inspection and you may call us for expedited services and we'll do the best to accommodate as we can. Um, there could be some instances when we schedule uh, an inspection that we may have to reschedule due to illnesses, emergencies, so on like that. So really we're asking everybody to be flexible. We're going to be as flexible with you guys and we ask the same thing from you, you know, so we can get the inspections going. When we call when we cross the threshold, we're going to show our state ID and we both parties are going to sign the notice of inspection rights. Um, basically you can read the notice of inspection while we're there, if it's an initial inspection or if it's due to a complaint or something to that effect. And then we'll summarize the points of the documents. And again, we're, we're really encouraging you to read it while we're there. <coughs> OK, on the rare occasion, on-site inspections, again, as I stated, may have to be rescheduled because of uh, emergencies, investigation, illnesses, weather, road conditions. And we just ask that you be flexible when that does happen. And again, on emergencies on your part, you know, again, we'll be as flexible with you. Uh, step three, we'll inspect the house, grounds, garage, garages and buildings and sheds, if any. Uh, we encourage you to walk with us through the process. Um, we'll inspect all vehicles that could, could potentially transport a resident. Um, this is a change from the past process in which you gave an attestation of the vehicles. Um, we need all the vehicles there at the time of the inspection, and there's going to be a process for vehicles who aren't, that aren't there, and we'll be talking about that next. <laughs> in the uh, handouts that we have out front, we're going to expect, inspect each vehicle and we'll inspect the service records of each vehicle. A copy of the service record is required to be at the house. So they can be kept at the main office, but a copy of the service record has to be kept with the vehicles at the house. Um, what will happen if you don't have all the vehicles available for inspection at the time of the on-site survey? That's the next slide we're going to discuss. You will need to bring them down to our office, and that's at 150 North 18th Avenue. Um, you'll have to drive all the vehicles down. Um, you'll have to coordinate with us so we can coordinate the time to actually inspect the vehicles. Um, this is a free service. Um, we're not going to be charging for that, but you will have to bring the vehicles down and we'll have to plan <coughs> ahead to, to, to do this. Uh, the inspection process, uh, it's going to be your responsibility to have a discussion about vehicle inspections with the surveyor when they call to schedule the inspection. So try to have, you know, when you actually schedule the inspection, you're going to talk to the surveyor, you're going to know the date, the time, 
So you have as many vehicles there as possible so they can look at the vehicles at the time during the survey. Um, they, can, they can accommodate nearly any variation of the scenario, but only if they know in advance. Um, it's much easier, the more advanced notice the person has, the better that they can actually plan for that particular inspection. And if you don't surprise us with the complications, the complicated situation or the unavailability of access to the vehicles, we won't disappoint you by citing the same deficiency. <laughs> Step five, we'll conduct an exit interview at the time you will be told about any deficiencies that are found. Um, we explain which deficiencies we're going to cite, which deficiencies we'll allow you to correct at the moment. Um, there's going to like on the spot deficiencies, something that can be fixed while we were there, quick fixes, so on like that. Um, any recommendations may other, that we may otherwise have, again, quick fixes that, that can be done, things that are uh, very simple that we'll talk about but we won't actually cite. We'll leave it a minimum of receipt for the inspection. Again, this is the receipt uh, for the inspection. This will show what we, this is what you will show DES, DDD when they arrive to do the final walkthrough at step six that Laura referred to. Um, you're, you're, your actual inspection report called a statement of deficiency will be sent to you later. And we'll be going to, we're gonna be talking about the statement of deficiency next. That's no fire inspection. Then statement of deficiency. Sorry, Rona's gonna be gonna be talking about the fire inspection. So as you know, we have a fire inspection form that's a, um, a three-copy NCR form. Um, moving forward, uh, in the year 2013 only, we'll be using those forms, and that's for fire inspections that expire in the year 2013. If you have a renewal inspection in 2013, the fire inspection report that you'll receive from the department will look like this, which is a two-year uh, fire inspection form. Um, this is also going to be on NCR paper. Um, we will scan a copy of the fire inspection and send that to DDD program monitoring with a copy of the license. We will retain the white copy for your licensing file and we'll leave with you the yellow and the pink copy. We encourage you to save one of them at the house, which is required in the rule, and the other one you can save at the corporate location if you have such a, an arrangement. Uh, page one is the level one requirements, which apply to all group homes. Page two is the level two requirements, that is, that are additional requirements on top of the level one requirements for obviously the level two homes. So some of you may ask, what about local jurisdiction? Um, there is um, an allowance made um, in the rule that says that you need to be in compliance with local jurisdictions. Um, we encourage you to uh, not um, ask the question of a local jurisdiction so that you don't find a more stringent requirement. Um, but also, uh, should it come up in any context, just be aware. Um, the Attorney General's Office in the state of Arizona had um, uh, enjoined the city of Avondale in a lawsuit, um, which was settled out of court and resulted in the consent degree that you see the front page of on the screen. Um, on the consent degree, you can see this number here. That is what you would reference if you choose to discuss with the local jurisdiction the precedents that had been sent with the Attorney General's office, which basically the consent degree states that the city of Avondale is not permitted to impose more stringent um, fire codes upon a group home because the group home is considered the resident's home and therefore should only have what other houses in the neighborhood have imposed upon it. Um, and we believe that is an appropriate uh, response. Um, for the license, we have specific fire rules that, we, that you're required to follow for the license, but we don't see the need to have additional codes be heaped upon you by another city. Um, we'll leave that up to the individual licensees to, to battle as they see fit. Our recommendation is to just work with us and retain our copies um, and try to stay off of their radar. Now, um, we have uh, new licensing rules and I want to give a little bit of background about um, what happened and why those new rules came about. Um, 
every agency in the state, um, when they have licensing rules, they have the requirement um, that's built in the Arizona Administrative Code that requires a five-year rule, rule review to be conducted. Um, that was conducted in 2011, and in 2012, we submitted um, the five-year rule review report, try saying that five times fast, to the Governor's Regulatory Review Council for consideration. Within that report, it identifies that the last time we updated the rules was in 2002. We identified that previous rules did not allow for industry innovations, such as the wireless connected um, smoke detection systems. Um, some rules were found to be a financial burden, um, and unnecessarily so. Some rules were found to be impractical or unenforceable. Some rules were found to be ineffective as far as safeguarding the health and safety of the residents uh, residing at the home. And some rules were found to just be lacking in wisdom. And what, what that means is um, it, it, it sounds good on the surface, but in every practicality, it doesn't really have the effect that we hoped the rule would have. So the department applied for an exemption to the moratorium on rulemaking. Um, and there's various criteria that you have to prove to the governor's office to be qualified for an exemption. We were then granted that exception. Um, and then our process took on the, the kind of the normal rulemaking process where you file a notice of intended rulemaking and you post the draft rules for public comment and you engage various stakeholders and that's what we did. We engaged providers and the provider association, meaning APAT, um, as well as DESDDD and ACCESS to gain consensus on the draft rules before we moved them forward in the process. We also engaged the department's fire marshals, the Bureau of Emergency Preparedness, the state's Health Emergency Ops Center, and the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing to ensure that rules pertaining to the health and safety had a scope with legitimate breadth and depth that reflect national standards. So why change the licensing rules? Well, as I mentioned before, when we did our analysis, we identified areas for improvement within um, the Department of Health Services Division of Licensing Services and the Office of Special Licensing. I realize it gets a bit confusing when we refer to a department in a division when you're dealing with the Department of Health and the Department of Economic Security and the Division of Licensing and the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So we'll be explicit when we mean DES, DDD. Otherwise, when we say department or division, we're referring to ourselves. Um, we identified potential barriers to licensure. We identified pathways of licensure to other kinds of licensure that might be appropriate. Um, it might interest you to know that the department right now is in process of developing what's called an integrated rules set that merges together um, medical facilities licensing and behavioral health rules. Um, that will go live, I believe, at the end of July of 2013. And what that will allow um, providers to do is to elect to become a different kind of an animal. So, some providers, instead of being a DD group home, a group home for the developmentally disabled, they'll choose to become an assisted living facility. And attached to that license will be the allowance of providing um, behavioral management in the form of physical holds um, in whatever manner is prescribed by the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And so that allows for um, greater flexibility in the licensing options for people who serve this population. Um, we also hope to create uniformity within licensure and investigative processes so that you'll know what to expect, we'll do things consistently, and we'll know what to expect, to expect in response from our providers. Um, that also goes with the way that we dovetail with our sister agencies, which are DES, DVD, and ACCESS. Um, we hope to reduce some costs of licensure, and I'll go into what those look like in just a moment. Um, and we hope to clarify some of the um, aspects of the rules that were previously ambiguous. And so it's impossible to be completely explicit in every way where we talk about a hazard. Obviously, a hazard can take on the form of many, many, many different kinds of situations, scenarios, um, dynamics. And um, so we're, we couldn't be that prescriptive or we would be just limited to those definitions. But where we were able to carve out explicit expectations, we've done so, and we hope that will be a help. Some of the specificity in the new rule set came directly from the um, licensed community uh, in which they asked for specific things. And so I'll touch upon this in a minute. And of course, our overall goal is to ensure the health and safety of the residents and the communities and the staff 
and anybody else who enters or visits the home. So now I want to talk about which rules were changed. And so I'll start with Article 1, which is the administrative section. Um, and I'm not going to go into the literal line-by-line -line details of the rules, because that would make this a five-hour training instead of just an hour training. Um, but you have um, in your packet, and I believe it was uh, emailed to all the people attending on the webinar, something uh, that looks like this. So. I don't know if that helps, but this is the um, Arizona Administrative Code chapter, uh, title, title 9, Chapter 13, Articles 1 and 2. So Article um, 101 and 102, in that section we expanded, added, deleted, and cross-referenced some definitions and the requirement for licensure. In Article 103, we added a controlling persons section for group homes. This is basically to facilitate um, compliance with uh, at Senate Bill 1070, where we have to verify U.S. citizenship or legal alien status, um, and it's rather self-explanatory. Um, do give us a call if you have any questions about the, um, the specific content in that section or if anything is unclear. And then sections 104 and 105 um, details um, information that we're allowed to collect on a licensing application, and it includes the U.S. citizenship documentation um, that's required by 1070. In section 106, um, that's a section called Changes Affecting Licenses. And what we hoped this would accomplish is that whenever there are any changes that are uh, enumerated in that section, that the licensee will submit to us in writing, and that can be done through email um, or through postal mail. Um, but we need to receive it in writing. And then we make the notation in our data system, and if necessary, on the license itself in few occasions. And then in section 107, uh, we delineate a clear complaint investigation process. Um, we believe that's pretty self-explanatory. Essentially, the department um, can receive complaints from literally any type of entity. Um, we do receive a lot of complaints from the um, resident loved ones and various guardians. We receive a lot of complaints that are really more just um, interagency communication from our sister agencies and our stakeholder partners. Um, and sometimes we receive complaints from APS or CPS um, and also from other types of um, people who are required reporters. So, for example, behavioral health therapist is a required reporter, and so they're required to report things that they see, obviously, to Child Protective Services and Adult Protective Services. Um, and they're also required to report things to the licensing entity. And because we issue the license, that then helps us uh, facilitate the transmission of that information to DVD and to access. Um, that's, those pieces aren't so clearly articulated in, the, um, in that section, uh, but you should know that that is part of our process. And then section 108 um, is a section called timeframes. That's a section that's required in all rulemaking, and that, um, that requirement came into effect after the last rules were updated in 2002. So it's a section that now um, clearly defines the time frame in which the department has to act on a given application and the time frames where the licensee has to respond to a given situation. <clears throat> and there's a table that kind of summarizes the overall calculation of the time frame. And then in section 109, uh, it delineates the potential legal actions um, that the department can take against the license, which includes denial, revocation, and suspension. I'm going to go a little bit more into those a little bit later on. And then I want to talk about what changed in the second article, which is more the group home standards kind of environmental section. In section 201, we expanded the requirement for written um, plan for emergencies so that it includes more of the disaster preparedness types of scenarios. So um, uh, many of you know that this last year, or perhaps it was the year before, I'm not sure, when we had the wildfires that were sort of encroaching on some of our more rural homes, uh, a couple of those homes were instructed to evacuate. And so we discovered in, in looking at, um, retrospectively at how those evacuations uh, were managed 
that some of them worked really well. They evacuated to a, a clear location where there was availabilities. Other people evacuated to hotels that were already filled with firefighters and there was one room that they had to cram all their residents in for a night until they could move them to another hotel out of the evacuation zone. So we saw you know, you have to contingency plan for all of these other types of scenarios. Um, and then later in the year when they had the blackout of the power in Mesa that lasted for more than 24 hours, there were a couple of homes that had to go and get generators or find emergency relocation um, sources. So we decided that it would be prudent to include those in our rules that in addition to the regular kinds of things you would plan for, which would be an internal fire, um, that we also want you to plan for uh, global things like um, pandemics and uh, terrorist attacks and things that could do, uh, incapacitate utilities and um, put first responders and take up resources. Um, and then in, moving on to section 202, um, that section we changed so that it reduced the cost related to fire extinguishers. Um, essentially, it allows instead of one fire extinguisher that costs a lot of money that has to have a tag every year, we allow for two of the disposable type because it has the same fire suppression coverage as the one, and those don't have to be retagged every year. They only cost 12 bucks, and you get them in a two pack at Costco or Sam's uh, Club or at Walmart. And um, so we, we saw that as being a cost savings. Uh, it also, um, that section moves the fire inspection requirement from annual to every two years. And then it also establishes a minimum uh, loudness or decibel level for the smoke detector alarms. This was one of the suggestions that was submitted by the um, licensees um, who you know, rightfully um, were under the impression that where it says that the um, fire alerting system has to be capable of alerting all residents at the same time. Um, for the bigger houses, we would go to one bedroom and they would, found, they would sound off the fire alarm in the farthest one in the facility. And we found that it really wasn't sufficient to alert the residents. And so they asked for clarification on just how loud. We did a lot of research. We consulted a lot of people and we came up with um, the requirement, which is a good deal. Just if you're wondering, it's 75 decibels at the level of the bed. And then it also creates greater flexibility of the staffing requirements for the level two homes if they choose to use the staffing option instead of the sprinkler system. And in section 203, we clarified the requirements of the physical structure of the home, including the requirement for GFCI, which is the um, those self tripping. Um, electrical outlets, uh, which will be required on all new and modification, uh, all new construction and modifications of existing homes. So, if you're going to remodel a bathroom, the expectation is that you will install CFGI, CGFI, um, self tripping um, electrical outlets. Um, and that would be true if you remodel the kitchen as well. It's, it's any outlet that's nearby a water source. Then in section 204, um, we, ex we specify and further articulate the environmental and facility hygiene standards, including the allowance of certain types of space heaters. Um, we know that this was a request and a common thing that we would cite when we were up in the northern part of the state in the wintertime, um, recognizing that a lot of those homes um, have central heating systems, but by the time they reached into where the bedrooms were, the client was sitting there shivering in blue. So uh, we wanted to do something and we did, again, a lot of research. We found out precisely which types of space heaters would be safe. Um, and we consulted with all of our stakeholders and partners and came to some consensus. So we hope that helps out those folks in the northern areas. In section 205, we clarified the documentation to retention requirements on vehicle maintenance and repairs. Um, so that was just minorly adjusted. And in section 206, we um, clarify and further articulate the safety aspects of the pool and spa enclosure requirements. Now, I realize that people have a lot of questions about this whole Article 2, um, especially if you're a licensee. Um, so again, if you have a question, um, please send it uh, using the 
drop down thing on the top. So if you go to the chat section, just click on send and select run or Geppert, not Mike Sotelo or ADHS. Um, and we'll be monitoring those again at the end of the seminar um, and giving you responses accordingly. So all of these changes have obviously implications for changes in our process. Um, with respect to inspections, uh, the department will only be inspecting homes that have applied for an initial licensing as, that, as directed by DES EDD. So our mandate is to create um, a network of beds and capacity for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Not intended to help any other um, sub part of DES or any other types of um, residents. So initial licenses moving forward will only be uh, executed at the direction of DDD. Um, for renewals, we'll keep renewing um, every existing license until a decision is made elsewise um, to get some group homes that are currently licensed merged into other provider types at a later date after July of 2013 comes about. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, for 2013, we'll continue to use the one-year fire inspection form to do those, and then all of the renewals in 2013, and then for everybody moving on in 2014, we'll be using the two-year fire inspection report, at which time we will discontinue using the one-year interim fire inspection report with few exceptions. And again, um, I, I'm not going to go into any detail, but there will be exceptions made um, primarily at the request of DDD. With respect to investigations, um, the department will conduct both announced and unannounced uh, investigations, as well as desktop off-site paperwork kinds of investigations. Um, and that will depend on the scope and severity of the allegations con con contained in the complaint. Our reporting will remain relatively the same, except for now, instead of getting a handwritten um, scanned copy of our audit tool, you'll receive an actual uh, legal document that is called a um, 2567 form or a statement of deficiencies. Um, and you'll also get that when there's no deficiencies. It will describe that we arrived and did an on-site inspection and found no deficiencies. Um, um, those, along with the plan of correction, will be posted to our, state, our uh, department website and will be uh, retained in the public file for three licensing periods. So that's six years in most cases. If you have homes that are accredited, that means nine years. So just be aware of that. Um, the department would like to make available to you all forms of technical assistance. Don alluded to it earlier that low-level deficiencies, which we define as deficiencies that do not overtly jeopardize resident safety and are corrected at the time of the on-site inspection, will generally not be cited in a statement of deficiencies. Now, by generally, what I mean is they're very low-level deficiencies, and, and we have a history with that home to know that they have every intention of following through. There are some homes, unfortunately, where we know from one year to the next that there has been compliance problems. And so in those cases, we will have to cite for repeat violations, even on a low-level deficiency, so that the uh, entity will take us seriously and bring the home into compliance. All surveyors, um, customer support staff, management staff, which is represented by all levels um, here presenting this today, uh, will provide a broad array of guidance, information, technical expertise, recommendations, all designed to um, ensure that you've considered the broadest spectrum, spectrum of options for complying with the rules. And we'd like you to engage us in that dialogue before expending substantial amounts of money on a corrective action. In many, many cases, we've been able to brainstorm and come up with a very affordable options that we believe meet the intent of rules, um, and we do that sometimes in collaboration with the ESDDD and also with um, select specific program monitors who uh, we have relationships with. So if you're viewing this webinar and you're a program monitor, we encourage you to get to know us and utilize us as a resource, and we will do likewise, likewise with you when we um, brainstorm for options for a given provider. 
And then as far as compliant actions, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, the department will on occasion exercise its authority to deny, revoke, or suspend a license where conditions are substantiated that pose an immediate jeopardy to the health and safety of residents. Um, now, we say residents, but what that statute is actually referring to is the health and safety of not just the residents at the home, but also the staff who work at the home, any people that might visit the home, whether it's a professional person coming in the, in the context of their job, or if it's a visitor that's coming to visit a resident, or if it's a neighbor that's coming over to chat you up about some issue they have with the driveway, or that the home is safe for the precocious next door neighbor kid who jumps the fence because the pool looks that inviting. Um, and also for, um, you know, just anybody who might be coming into the home or on the premises. The, the home is um, looked at for safety in consideration of all those potential um, people who would step foot on the premise. On the premise. When we do um, decide to take an action against a license, we do not do that in a vacuum. We do that um, in a very coordinated way with the Division of Developmental Disabilities and sometimes with access if it's, um, if it's an issue that they're going to be requesting monies to be refunded on. Um, in most cases, it's with the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Um, and so there have been times where we've had to close a home and we've had to coordinate removal of the residents. We don't like that scenario. We believe it's upsetting to residents. We believe it's um, a hardship to staff who then have to not work and not get paid. Uh, so the best way to avoid that is to use our inspection tool and self-audit before we get there and find things deficient. Obviously, that implies things for your processes. Now, I could spend some time going through all of these things that we hope you would do, and these are things that we suggest. I'm not going to take that much uh, time out of today, but please um, do review this slide at a later date and consider the things that are recommended and strongly encouraged. Um, that will help you um, avoid problems and keep the communication between the licensee and the regulators in check. Um, now I'm going to have Don come back up and he's going to talk about statements of deficiencies and plans of corrections. <laughs> okay, as Renault talked about, uh, each inspection will have a statement of deficiency, whether there is a deficiency or not. Um, it'll say that there is a statement of no deficiencies. So no matter what, when somebody comes out, you are going to get a copy of this. And this is an official form. It's the 2567 or the statement of deficiencies. Um, the department will only issue a 2567 for a complaint investigation when rule violations are found, regardless of whether they are part of the allegation of the, or the, of the complaint. And what that is, is if somebody complains about something that we have jurisdiction on, <laughs> and we go out to investigate, and we see something that is blatant uh, that needs to be repaired or fixed or something like that, we could cite on the statement of deficiency. So it's not just relevant to the complaint, but it's while we're out there at the same time and we see something that is that could be amiss and then we'll, we'll go ahead and discuss it and cite it if need be. Um, this is a copy of the statement of deficiency. Um, basically, the number one is the complaints or the initial invested or the initial uh, and survey. Two is the tag number of the actual complaint or of the uh, the regulation. Three is the actual regulation, and it states what the regulation is below it. Four is what our findings were for that particular either complaint survey uh, of, of the investigation. Where the, the POC option, that's a point of correction option, and you will get a copy of this. Well, the original will go to you after we finish the survey or the investigation. You have an option of putting in the plan of correction on this form, but it is not the preferred way that we want to receive it. We do have a form that I'm going to be talking about next, but there is an option if you want to use that to put your plan of correction on it. Uh, plan of corrections must include the original statement of deficiency when you send them back to us. 
and the department prefers and encourages to use this template, which is right there. Um, this is the plan of correction template. Very, it has all the information that's on the statement of deficiency. It has the licensee name, type, the rule of the statute, so on like that. And then you would just write what you plan to do to correct the deficiency that was cited in the statement of deficiency. You would return this along with the statement of deficiency to our office. Um, so we can make sure that it's in your file, and then we track all the statement of deficiencies that were cited during the, either the survey or the complaint investigation. Um, if there's a no deficiency statement of deficiency, you won't get a plan of correction. <laughs> uh, training and support resources. The department is developing uh, license, licensing and consumer resources pages. Uh, basically, that's for either you guys or consumers to actually go to get information about group home. Um, the licensee resource webpage will include a calendar of train, training events that the department provides. If you guys have training that you want to, to announce to other people that you, know, you want to give, we can actually put that on our, on our calendar so people have access to it through our website. Um, the, de the department may develop substantive, poli substantive policies and our guidance documents in order to further clarify rules or delineate a recommended practice in order to enhance, preserve, protect the overall health and safety of group home for residents, staff, visitors, neighbors, and the general public. And then next is RONO for the emergency preparedness. Um, the following slides were developed by uh, <clears throat> Joel Bunnis, who is um, one of the people who takes on the role of commander in the Health Emergency Operations Center uh, when there is a declared emergency and certainly when we're doing drills. Um, so uh, we just wanted to acknowledge that um, he went through some effort to really take into consideration the things that we learned out of previous um, declared emergencies and various drill scenarios that the department has under, undergone in the past couple of years. So the first thing to ask yourself is what happens during an emergency? When you're developing the plan, what happens during an emergency? Hospitals um, and other licensed facilities, such as a group home, they communicate with the Health Emergency Operations Center in the licensing section and their county health department. The plans are activated when there's a, a heat warning in some cases, um, and in particular when there's a power outage. Um, when wildfires occur, um, when and if any a terrorist attack should occur. Uh, also, when there are large crowds for whatever reason in a particular area, uh, and, and for other scenarios like pandemic um, spreads, uh, influenza, and um, what was the other one? West Nile virus. And so the approach that we encourage you to take is to plan for every type of contingency. We encourage you to work directly with your stakeholders, obviously of which we are one. Also work with um, DES and the Department of Transportation and ACCESS. Um, you should work with your county local health department. Um, you should coordinate with all of the facilities that you might have as part of your network. Um, if you're alone, we encourage you to work with your association, um, which is APAD. And um, we encourage you in your plan to develop and articulate real clear priorities for your staff to develop. And of course, the first order of business is patient safety, staff safety, patient medications, and then belongings and paper files and things of that sort should come um, tertiary or even last. So that's okay. Now, in, with respect to um, a declared emergency and how the department interacts with facilities that it licenses, of which group homes for developmentally disabled are one, um, we will uh, help instruct um, through the county health departments um, when there is a need to take an emergency action, whether that's an evacuation of an area or a relocation of a, of a zip code. Um, and then when uh, an evacuation has occurred, before you're able to actually move back into the home, our surveyors will have to come out and reinspect the home to ensure that no damage is remaining from whatever it was that caused us to ask you to evacuate. 
We will do that, of course, in a very um, expedited, really quick manner. Um, those of you that were affected by the wildfire remember how we got out there within 12 hours when you told us that you wanted to return to inspect those homes. Um, so we do have a quick turnaround time when it comes to emergencies. You have to consider in your plan how you're going to communicate with your partners and stakeholders, and you should have a plan B, which we consider in the department to be what's called a COOP plan, and COOP is an acronym that stands for Continuity of Operations Plan. And so that's when um, all, of, all of our process are, are um, IT dependent, and so should there be something that knocks out our connectivity or um, uh, electromagnetic pulse that knocks out the, the electrical system, we have the capability within our plan B to uh, still process paperwork using desktop paper as if we would have done before they ever invented computers until such time as the power is restored and we have the ability to re-enter into our data systems. We encourage you to have a similar kind of plan. So if that means a process for obtaining medications through access, or if it means a process for requesting through the Department of Health Services access to medications through the national stockpile if it's a declared national emergency, or through the state stockpile, which is um, something that the governor would declare. Your plan should also be mindful of the financial considerations, so the access to money. Um, so that would include if you conduct things um, using cash, you should consider the location and availability of those cash resources, which are ATMs and banks. Um, you should consider um, contacting access to ensure that the flow of uh, Medicaid and Medicare dollars um, is going to be unimpeded or if you anticipate problems um, with getting paid, you should be proactive and contact ahead of time as part of your plan, um, the funding sources. Um, we also have the ability to help facilitate communication with funding sources in the event of a declared emergency. So if you're finding um, little help with your local health department, definitely do go through the state department of health um, and one way or another we'll get your issue addressed. And then the plan that you develop should um, obviously take into consideration everything about your residents. In this case, we're calling this the recipient. So um, access to transportation may become limited. Uh, when the wildfires happened and they had to evacuate literal neighborhoods, they actually used city metro buses, took them off planned routes, had them drive up there and start loading up families and their possessions and moving them around. Um, and so that meant that a couple of those lines no longer were being serviced. So you should be taking those sorts of things into consideration. You should assume that transport, public transportation will be somewhat um, impeded and possibly compromised. Um, it will also affect whether or not you're able to receive visitors in the home. So if you're asked to evacuate, your evacuation um, plan should include how you're going to um, communicate with people who would normally visit. So family members, um, case managers, legal guardians, guardian ad litems, those sorts of individuals, you should communicate your new whereabouts so that they don't show up unannounced in a regular way um, at the home when it's actually been moved uh, for health reasons. And obviously you should plan for um, where you're gonna go. And um, so in this slide that was developed for us, this person put communications, communications, and then some communications. And we really encourage your plan to really focus on that communication piece. That is how the uh, State Emergency Operations Center develops its plan. That is how every county health department develops its plan. That is how FEMA develops its plan. Um, did you improve FEMA? Other considerations would be to um, have discussions with your staff, obviously prior to the event occurring so that they're aware of the plan. Um, we include, uh, we encourage collaborative planning. So if you have um, known neighbors that could be helpful in the event of an emergency, if there's a, a nurse nearby, if there's a doctor nearby, engage them as a community resource um, as part of your plan. Try to have a plan B, maybe even a plan C. Um, and then you should be aware that licensing does sit directly on the Health Emergency Operations Center. And so we're there as the communication linkage to access additional um, communication platforms such as our um, alert system. 
Um, and we can immediately address an issue like making resources available, making funding available for other emergency things. We can make portable devices such as um, respirators and generators available um, on a case-by-case -case basis, so just bear that in mind. Um, and that really kind of sums up our presentation. We're then um, next going to open it up for um, question and answers. Um, I do want to uh, thank the um, Bureau of Emergency Preparedness for helping um, develop these slides and certainly for safeguarding all of our lives in the event of emergency. Um, and I do want to thank our partners that helped us develop the rules um, and gave us a consultation um, for uh, advocating on how to address special needs populations within the CP population. So questions. Um, Don will read the written ones first from the webinar folks. And then we'll take questions from those of you here. Okay, the first one is from Sue Mitchell. Uh, do you care who from the agency accompanies you on the walk to the property? We have an operations coordinator who completes the inspections with DHS. Recently, we were told by the surveyor that it has to be the site manager. Um, my my um, best guess at that scenario, if I had to hazard a guess, would be that um, our surveyor had previously been told by the agency that it had to be their site manager, so they're, I'm betting, quoting what they have heard in the past. Now, certainly, if the process changed, they should have uh, let that person know. Um, but in terms of our process, we can walk through with whomever the licensee, the licensed entity decides. It can be literally the staff that opens the door. It can be um, a, a site manager. It can be a repair manager. It can be a um, human resources coordinator, whomever the agency wants to send down to have us walk through, we'll do that. Now, when we arrive, we hope to sign the um, notice of inspection rights with whoever answers the door so that we can legally cross the threshold and um, do the inspection. We may start to do the uh, inspection before the designated person arrives, and then we'll just kind of backtrack with that person to catch them up. Um, but we, we encourage you to have somebody, even if it's the staff that opens the door, um, accompany us. One more from Bernard Colonna. When will the new inspection forms for the group homes be available on the DHS website? Uh, so the question was, when will our inspection form be available on the DHS website? Um, we hope to have that available by the end of this week. Um, however, the, the department is in the process of updating its web page template. Um, and so uh, until I coordinate specifically with the person, with the technician who's doing that, I won't have a certain date, but we hope to have it up there soon. I can certainly email it, and so can Don and Laura um, and anybody else at our office, as well as the surveyors, um, can email the tool directly to you if you contact us through email. Um, and I believe that was uh, also sent out earlier with the invitations, which you should have gotten when you received the invite to attend the webinar. Okay, and if there are any other questions from folks who are attending the webinar, please submit them now. And again, you have to send that directly to Rono Geppert, not to Mike Sotelo or ADHS. And then now we'll open the questioning up to the folks who are live in attendance here today. Yes, sir. Um, so the question was, do we investigate complaints um, where things are broken, such as plumbing and electrical outlets and ramps and things of that sort? Uh, the answer is, of course, yes. Anything pertaining to the physical environment of the home falls under the jurisdiction of our licensing activities, and our complaint investigation activities are inclusive of that. We absolutely would. Now, we, we may um, postpone the investigation of it to when we're going to be there on site for a licensing inspection, if that's coming up due in the following month, um, you know, to, to make wise use of our time. Um, or we'll wait until we're going to be up in the same general region. So, for example, if we call, if someone calls and we've got a home uh, complaint, such as you described on the home and page, um, well, if the two weeks from now we're planning on going up to license other homes in page we might wait until we're going to be that far up into the area before we investigate it but we do investigate all the complaints that we receive even if they're of minor things like that now 
That having been said, sometimes what we will do is call up the agency and say, hey, we've gotten a complaint that the light fixture in the bathroom was shattered. Can you please go repair or replace that and then take a photo, a photo of it and email us that photo? We accept that as evidence that they brought that issue into compliance. So there are ways that we can ameliorate things and address things um, as a desktop sort of level of inquiry. So it just depends on the scope and severity. Did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, one of the questions I had was the fire risk prevention level. Um, are we still utilizing the task to utilize the uh, fire risk profile uh, uh, sheet to decide if the person uh, or group home uh, is uh, going to be a level one or level two? Is that what you're assuming that we're continuing to use or certain changes in that? Uh, so the question was, um, do we plan on still utilizing the fire risk profile to determine the fire risk prevention level? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, what we do when we arrive, obviously for initial, we don't have the luxury of having the profile readily available for us to look at in most cases. Um, but definitely on a renewal, that document should be in place at the facility and we will look at it and, and, and if the score is above 300, we will say that this home has to be a level two, and we will inspect it accordingly and cite it where it's deficient along those lines. And still, there were no changes in the rules under previous rules. You don't have to do the fire risk profile for four, four or more individuals at all. That's well, how the rules been. And that's what I wanted to clarify. Right? But I didn't see that anywhere that uh, make sure there wasn't any changes. And uh, normally, in a DD group home, we don't do the fire risk profile if you have three or less folks. Yeah, and th that makes sense because if you have three or less, and if each individual individual person can score only up to 100, right. then obviously right. it becomes a moot point. Um, that having been said, though, we have encountered homes where there there have been three people and they're all on ventilators, and um, we then say, well, how many people are here at night? And they'll say one person and um, in many of those cases, we said then you probably really should install a sprinkler if you're really going to try to save on the staffing. Because in the event that a crisis occurs with any given individual, um, the ability for one person to uh, remove a tube, put them on something mobile, and then get them out precludes them from being able to evacuate that particular scenario. Right, and so we would give... I beg your pardon, I didn't mean to interrupt. So we would give a lot of technical assistance around preparing uh, in a better way for those types of contingencies. And in many cases, those folks have installed sprinkler systems. Did you have another question? I, I, I did, yeah, mm -hmm. I had just a, a couple here. Um, uh, one of the things that you said that uh, uh, sometimes the initials need approved by DD. Uh, so for instance, if a house is moving, and just wanted to clarify the process, if a house is uh, Leases up and decided the families decided we want to move to a different address. We have to get something from DDD that has to be included in the application that says they are approving this home because it's, a, it's an initial now. Right. Uh, it's not a renewable the initial for another set, uh, another location. So we have to get a, something from DDD. I, mean, I, I guess I'm wondering what that is from DDD that I have to get from them. Okay. To say it's okay to go ahead and, and, and so I, I, I'm assuming then that you are a group home operator. Yes. Okay. So the question was, um, when a group home is faced with the prospect of having to relocate perhaps because the lease is up and they're moving or for whatever reason, they want to get away from a bad pool enclosure, whatever it is, um, that is treated by our department as an initial application. And we've mentioned before that initial applications, for initial application surveys, we're going to get approval first from the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And your question is, what kind of documentation are we looking for? Um, if it was otherwise construed in the way I presented it earlier, which I'm owning as a possibility, I misspoke. What we do is we call the Division of Developmental Dis Disabilities to confirm that they do, in fact, have residents staying there. Um, now, if they have no residents staying there and they still want the capacity to be in the location where that home is going to move, all they have to do is say, yeah, go, and we'll go and license that facility. What we're trying to get away from is the very 
um, infrequent, but frequent enough that it's been brought on to our attention. Um, there have been some providers that get a qualified vendor agreement with DDD. They open up that home. They have one or two residents in the home. Um, and then they decide they're going to go and purchase three other houses because when the housing bubble popped, they became very affordable. And they wanted now those to all be licensed as DD group homes. And um, we were spending a lot of our resources and time going out to license those homes when DDD had no intention of placing anybody in those homes. Um, and so we're trying to just use our resources wisely. Um, incidentally, the way that licensing activities get paid for is by um, the Department of Health Services putting up funds that then get matched by the um, <coughs> access system. So they're, they're not fees that are generated from licensees. Um, and so we have to very, be very um, cautious and conscientious um, and good stewards of that, those tax dollars. Um, did you have another question? I did. Mm -hmm. Just one more. Uh, all right. Uh, under the uh, emergency procedures and evacuation drill, I, I really appreciate all the information you shared on, on what those should look like. My question is, is that the rule itself here doesn't have all of the things that you you recommend it should be in those, and I'm concerned that that um, if we follow the rule in developing. Uh, uh, which we've already developed, uh, uh, you know, how to evacuate in case of emergency, fires, because we're up north, we're all over, we have all of them. But I know she had like a financial section in there, which I, I don't think is in ours. Uh, uh, if those things are left out of that plan and the inspector come out and rules out of compliance, even though it's not in, it's not in the rule. So, um, the, the question was, um, for the emergency preparedness plan that a, um, an agency or a group home develops, um, do they need to have all of the content that I had just discussed in our presentation, such as the financial section and things of that sort? Um, and your question was specific to, would you be cited by us when we came in and reviewed the policy? Um, and so the answer to that is no. Um, what we generally want to do when we get on site with respect to looking at documentation, and in particular the emergency preparedness documentation, is that you do have a plan. And that your plan addresses not just how you would evacuate the home, but if you had to evacuate the area or the city or the county or the state if you're on the border. Um, so, so that's all we're looking for is that you have um, plans that appear to be of a um, broad enough scope to, to take into consideration those new things that we've learned with the wildfires, with the pandemic flu, and those sorts of things. Well, I really like this presentation, so uh, we'll definitely use that and add that to our plan. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, we're not, we're, not, we're not in the business of critiquing your paperwork because we're there to ensure the health and safety of the environment, um, but as a means of technical assistance, we may offer some along those lines when we look at your plan if it's lacking anything there or anything. Uh, but it wouldn't be cited. Did you have any other questions? No, I didn't. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Do you have an 11-page licensing inspection checklist? Is that all going to be left at the group home by the inspector uh, when it's completed? Or is it just going to be the final page and then you can go and pick it? Um, um, we have portable scanners that both of our surveyors have. And so they can leave the document if uh, they would like it or if DDD would like it. Um, but we're, because we use that document um, to develop the statement of deficiencies, which is going to be the new thing that comes out of, um, as of next week, um, we have to bring the document back so our surveyor knows what notations they've made in order to transcribe it into the data system that generates that report. It's not going to be one of No, but as I said, we can scan it so that we retain it on a chip and leave the paper copy with them if they would like it to work off of until they re receive the formal written report. Um, and certainly the receipt page um, is what we can leave so that they can show that to the program monitor um, that explains that a statement of deficiency is on the way or that no, a statement of no deficiency is on the way. Um, and certainly, I, I, I think you especially know that we 
um, we'll give out our phone numbers freely for our surveyors and work directly with program managers if, or program monitors if you have questions, um, and certainly with you all as providers if you have any questions. So we can do it either way, um, but one way or the other, we have to respond to the document that will eventually arrive in the mail or as an email attachment. And one other question. Sure. Uh, what if group home has uh, individuals from the, the consumers that are living in the home are removed when the agency does not choose to terminate operations in a group home? How long can they maintain the license after that without having consumers in the home? So say they're providing service, they've had an initial inspection uh, on your section 106, changes affecting licensee. One of the things that they have to notify you for is termination of operation of a group home. If it's not their decision to close a group home, let's say that uh, individuals move back home with their families or uh, become more independent, move into like an IDLA or an ADH or a CDH, how long can they maintain a license with no these consumers and before, before they have to terminate the license? Okay, so the question was um, when residents leave for positive reasons, um, how long does the license remain in effect and does the home have to report that to us as one of the termination requirements in section 106? Did I get that correctly? Okay, um, so the answer to that is in that, what we would consider to be a helpful scenario where residents move in with people they feel more comfortable with or whatever the dynamics you just described were, um, we would not consider that to be equal to a closure of a group home. Um, and their license would remain in effect until the expiration date, and they would have the option of renewing that license. Now, when they renewed the license moving forward, so uh, that means as of 2014 and beyond, we will then ask to see a copy of the QVA upon which we'll have a specific license, I mean, a specific address for that home. Um, and then if they have not provided services for a full licensure period, which is two years, then we will um, bring up the matter with our Assistant Attorney General in consideration of denying them a renewal in some cases. Um, the vast majority of those cases will be as directed by the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Again, our role is to ensure capacity for that division. Did that answer your question? You look like you, you had more to it that you wanted to explore. No, I just, I just wanted to know if they had to report to you that, or, or ask a request to close the license once they no longer have these consumers, uh, or if there was a time frame in between where like, they had to have plans to put these consumers back into that home in a certain time frame before they have to you know, terminate the license and then request the new one uh, if and when they got additional consumers. Um, yeah, that, that will sometimes occur. Um, yeah, it, yeah, if the home becomes vacant for whatever reason, um, you know, it's not necessarily all positive. It could be that the consumer's family wanted them to move because they didn't like the setting or they want the staff or work for whatever reason. And at the time, their ISPs are allowed to move without uh, that would be cause. Um, if that happens and the home is vacant, how long can they maintain a license if they have no consumers? Uh, um, and I'll give a reason, you know, we monitor group homes, even if one of their license, we want we monitor them. So the longer that they're vacant, we still we're still constantly having to go we'll follow up with them. I just wonder if there's a time frame they would have to yeah. ask for a termination of license if they don't have to. In in a general sense, it would have to be a duration that that um, encompasses a full licensure period. So if we if the residents all left at um, year one into the two-year license, then they could renew it because within the previous licensure period, they had guests. But then in the next licensure period, if they had no residents, I'm sorry, I misspoke. If they had no residents in the subsequent licensure period, then we would, in most cases, not renew that license. But we would not make that decision in a vacuum. Of course, we would make that in consultation with the Division of Developmental Disabilities and certainly with access. Um, and there may be instances where DDD would say, we need beds in that area, so keep it licensed, and we would. Um, now, that having been said, if the Division of Developmental Disabilities revokes a QDA or um, tells us that they're not going to ever place anybody ever again in that home, we would consider that notification of closure. 
and we would then um, act upon that. We would call and request it, and if they did not give us documentation telling us to close their facility, we would probably initiate a revocation scenario. Um, again, we're trying to not do things that sound so punitive, um, but at the same time, we don't want you spending tax dollars and resources spinning your wheels just like we don't want to do the same in our agency. Yes, sir. Uh, that brings up another question. As a monitor, I'm in a district, district web, you receive uh, numerous calls from existing providers. You touched on it a little bit as far as they're planning on opening up a new home because they're receiving phone calls from the Child Protective Services after hours, like when the CPS DDD child is in their home. So, how does that affect as far as the new home? Um, they're, they're, um, just as a bit of history, there was um, an agreement that was reached um, with other um, uh, individuals within the Department of Health Services excuse me, in particular in the Division of Behavioral Health Services, where they were looking at um, unique scenarios and trying to figure out what's the best kind of um, flexibility that we can offer to prevent um, unintentional separation of siblings. And so the agreement was, if there was a child who was DDD eligible or DDD enrolled, and they were being removed from their home and there was one or two or more siblings, that all of the siblings could be relocated to the DD group home. Um, now, that, was, uh, that is so that the DDD resident has other forms of support, i.e. their brothers and sisters, who can make them feel more relaxed, help redirect them, help them be more responsive to staff. Um, certainly in whatever CPS is doing with respect to unification of the children back with their um, family or their parents, um, it would involve the siblings all being able to engage one another in their daily lives to demonstrate normalcy. Um, so that having been said, what we have found to be the case in a couple of instances where um, that was indeed the case in the start of it, and then the DDD enrolled client and their siblings were eventually reunited with their family, but in the meantime, that provider had accepted other CPS placements, and, the C and that home was now essentially functioning as a CPS group home shelter. Um, when we find that to be the case, we then approach the providers and we say, listen, if you want to be a group home shelter for CPS kids, you need to become a child welfare agency, and we give them uh, Steve Halstead's number and say, go through them. You have to become licensed by them as such, and at which time you would surrender our license. We give them a period of time in which to achieve that objective, and if they don't achieve that objective, then we don't renew the license. Um, certainly, we would go out if we received a complaint, and this has occurred in the past, where we've um, been contacted and they said, hey, your group home has 15 kids in it. And ooh, that, that's a trigger for us, because our license is only good for up to six bodies. So we went in and found out um, in that particular home that they were all CPS placements. We contacted DDD and they did some research to confirm that none of them were in fact um, DDD consumers or DDD eligible. Um, and so we um, worked in tandem with the Division of Developmental Disabilities to contact the appropriate people in CPS to have those children removed. Um, and so we're cognizant of the um, issue and we are trying to address it over time. Um, we hope that when the rules integration project that the department is undergoing takes effect at the end of July, that there will now be assisted living options and behavioral health options for CPS to get appropriately licensed homes set up. So we have an existing agency. They want to open up a new DDD group home. The only way you guys are going to come out is if because DDD is going to say, yeah, we have someone we want to place in that home, and then you'll come out? Um, so the, the, the question was, again, with respect to somebody purchasing, somebody who's already got a qualified vendor agreement and an established DDD group home, and they purchased property when it was um, financially wise to do so, um, and then they contacted us for an initial inspection. And the question was, 
um, to clarify, are we then going to only go out when we have approval from DDD that they intend on placing people there? Um, the answer to that is yes in most cases. Um, however, we will, as part of our discussion with the Division of Developmental Disabilities, excuse me, um, we will say, now think about capacity for that region of the town and consider whether or not you think it's helpful to have two more homes that have the capacity to provide a bunch of respite care. So that means contacting you know, the people who have placed people elsewhere to see if that home is located near the parents of residents and might be a resource in that way. So we are creative and, and hand-holding with our sister agencies, um, but what we're, again, what we're trying to prevent is going out and licensing homes if there's never going to be a DB consumer placed there um, because that's just not how the system was set up and um, it's frankly not a good use of tax dollars. Did that answer your question? Any others? Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you to all of you who attended on the webinar. Again, this webinar uh, is being recorded and will be available on our website in the coming couple of weeks. Uh, so if you were, if your um, associates and other employees were not able to attend, please do encourage them to access that through our portal. And um, we'd be happy to then take their questions in any of the previously mentioned ways of submitting questions. Thanks again and drive safely.